California State Superintendent of Public Instruction for eight years, from 1995 to 2003, and was the first and the only woman in history elected in this position. Now she does speaking and consulting, and I would say in advocating continually on our behalf and being a champion for children and for the families across the state. Of course, she's received numerous awards, state and national recognition for all of her contributions for children. Really, a, a true champion and legend in her own right. Please join me in welcoming Delaney Stacey. Thank you very much, Nina, and all of you for uh, being here this morning. I know uh, it's a very demanding life that you have and that you've come to the Capitol at this propitious time is extraordinarily important to us, and we thank you. Um, I, I want to just say I think the work you do is so extraordinary, and I, I feel badly, actually, that the governor of our state has unappreciated what a critical job it is to nurture and develop children before they enter kindergarten. And I really hope that we can, in fact, link arms and invite many more of our young parents and our grandparents and even great-grandparents to join with us to speak out for the youngest among us. Because, in fact, this is a moment where California's greatness will be determined. Whether we go backward and allow the erosion of such wonderful work over the last several decades, or whether we go forward to build a great state and to, in fact, build a great group of citizens for the future. I have to say, I think you're true American heroes. And if you think I'm overstating it, and you're thinking, I'm, I'm here, all right. Yeah. You know, I, I had an epiphany a few years ago. I realized that not many real heroes that I've met in my life look like John Wayne or Miss America. The real heroes that I've known in my life more likely look like Abe Lincoln or Margaret Sanger or Harry Truman or Harriet Tubman. They look like Mr. Rogers or Betty White more than they did like the famous people of Hollywood. And the real heroes of the piece are people like you who get up and do the important work with little children. Now, I have to say, most heroes are intelligent, but lots of intelligent people are not heroes. The fact is that most heroes are insightful, but lots of insightful people have no heart to do the important work at hand. Most heroes are perhaps unsure of what strategy needs to be followed for success, but they try and try again. Sadly, lots of aware people lack the vision to take a chance to promote a strategy and to get things done. So when I speak of heroes, I'm speaking of people like you assembled here trying to stop a very ill-considered $517 million cut to child development suggested by the government. And I have to say that it is criminal to kick 62,000 children to the curb because they happen to be under five. And when you think about the scale of that, I want to just make, put this into some, uh, some context. 62,000 is an army of children. It's an army. Years ago, I was at a meeting of the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the superintendent of Wyoming came up to me and said, oh, Blaine, you are, you are sending all of your kids to Wyoming. We're just growing in leaps and bounds. You're so lucky you're not growing. We're having a hard time building classrooms and accommodating the kids, all the people moving from California, I swear. And I said, well, we're not growing at the rate we used to grow, but we're still growing quite a bit. She says, you can't be growing as much as we are. I said, well, you know, I think we probably are growing more. She said, no, how many kids did you add last year? I said, 110,000, and the year before it was 140,000. She said, oh my God, where did you put them? <laughs> the whole state of Wyoming's population of students was just over 80,000. So when you think about 62,000 kids that Jerry Brown is proposing to push out of child development, you're thinking about a small state worth of t children. And it's, it's not right. Now I have to say that I know that Jerry said that he was, um, he was kicked out of preschool and it hadn't harmed him. <laughs>
because the people who need child development the least, first they're the most likely to be in preschool, but the ones who need it the least are those who have parents who are college graduates. And we know Jerry's father was an attorney because he was the district attorney of San Francisco, the state's attorney general, and then the governor. And Jerry, for the time, was from a very privileged family. So the fact that he was kicked out of kindergarten and it didn't hurt him doesn't say anything about those 62,000 individuals that he, whose lives he could hurt. Now I have to say that for many years, Department of Finance has suggested this move where we shorten the amount of time that kids can actually get support and where we, in fact, move it out of child development in the Department of Education and move it over to social services because they do it for so much less. And that is the old story, you get what you pay for. The reality is that child development is different. It means something more than just making sure they're housed safely, which is all Jerry wants to worry about. Development means that they enter kindergarten ready to learn, that they enter kindergarten healthy and with a good ability to relate to other children, and that in fact they have done developmental things in those years before they walk through the front door of kindergarten rather than nothing, or worse still, watching television endlessly. The fact is we cannot make childcare a hit or miss game of guesswork for the youngest among us who are parents and for the poorest among us who are parents. They're the very people that need the most guidance, direction, support, and our support. So when you think about early education, we have to be thinking about, you know, actually developing information, which is what we've been doing, about our providers. We've been able to think about the age groups served and the schedules offered and the spaces available because of a whole host of groups of people, from the child care resource and referral people to the Department of Education to First Five to this wonderful organization. We have been working to improve our ability to support the youngest among us. And to take a step away from that is to really step back from what's important in California. Good grief, Jerry Brown is fighting for high-speed rail. Now, let me just tell you, I'm all for high-speed rail. But I voted no on it because they didn't develop a source of funding for it. And until somebody can figure out how to pay for it, every time we do something with borrowed money, remember Arnold said he was going to tear up the credit card? He also said, I cannot be out of money. I still have checks in my checkbook. The reality is everything he, does, he did, and what Jerry's proposing to continue, things like high-speed rail that we do not pay for, they actually cost three times the amount that you see on the ballot because it's like buying your car on your credit card. If you've ever done that, don't ever do it again. <laughs> the truth is that you don't buy cars on credit cards for, because the car would wind up costing you three times as much as the sticker price. And that's exactly what will happen with high-speed rail. In fact, they lied to us about how much it's going to cost. They're creeping up the estimate. But on top of that, just triple the figure. The water bond. Jerry Brown should kill that thing. If there was ever anything in the world you could charge money for, it would be water. Instead of paying for it by raising the fees on water, which would promote conservation, by the way, Jerry Brown and the governor before him and the legislature before him, this one, are talking about putting it on the ballot and we'll do it with borrowed money. Whenever you borrow money in the state of California, if the pie doesn't get bigger and you cut a big $33 billion slice out of the pie and half of the pie is K through higher ed, Guess what? Half of the pie, I mean, half of the money for things like water come out of the pie. Raise the price of water. Some of you flew here. You went at the airport, you went through, you bought a $3 bottle of water. I guess people will pay for water now, won't they? The bottom line is we've got to begin to pay as we go and stop balancing the budget of the state of California on the backs of the children of California. We know. We know that there's a difference between expense and investment. Expense is, some, is money you just spent. It's just the money you got the three dollar bottle of water with. It's the money you bought the jacket you didn't need with. It's the. It doesn't really. You know, it's not an investment. Your 401k, there's an investment. You're you're helping your grandchildren or your children to go to college. That's an investment. When you buy a house, that's an investment. But the truth is, and frankly, if you need a car to go to work, then that could be an investment. But frankly, the idea that we would continually, in this state, 
Cut education because the kids get the biggest share of the pie. They have to suffer the deepest cuts. That's really what they're saying in that building over there. And you know what the Constitution of this is the problem with term limits? No, I, I don't think most of the people in the legislature know that the Constitution of the state of California says that even before the payment of debt, you are to educate your children. And we know that starts before they enter kindergarten. We know that education is critical from zero to five. I love this book, The Scientist in the Crib. Some of you may have seen it. It's a wonderful book. If you like to read, I, I am going to go look for prayer for the 21st century myself. But this book says, just as everything in our minds is caused by our brain, everything about our brains is ultimately caused by our evolutionary history. For human beings, nurture is our nature. The new developmental research suggests that our unique evolutionary trick, our central adaptation, our greatest weapon in the struggle for survival is precisely our dazzling ability to learn when we are babies and to teach when we are grown-ups. It's a beautiful book, but it really does speak to the magic of what happens from zero to five. The reality is that when we look at children's development, we, we ought to know that this should become the new priority for the state of California. This is more important than high-speed rail will ever be, so that a few rich people can go quicker from Fresno to Los Angeles. Good luck on that. The reality is, I'm all for building high-speed rail, as I said, but you're going to have to put a tax on gas or something to pay for it. You can't take it out of the existing money that is too small now. And in the end, when we look, you know, I'm so proud of Molly Munger and the Advancement Project. Don't be fooled. I'm voting for Jerry's thing, okay? But I'm voting for Molly Munger's initiative. The truth is, it is our future, these children. And yes, she put some money, $4 billion in there, who are balancing the budget. And yes, she put money in for K-12, but she also put money in for pre-K. This is, this is visionary. Look. Do you know that during the Second World War, the Congress of the United States actually passed a bill that gave child development money to all of the 48 states? You know why they did that? So many women were in the workforce. Let's see, were there more women in the workforce during World War II or now? It would be now, if anything, if it was needed in World War II, it's more needed today. And besides that, we've got an art mountain of research that tells us how important early education is. But heck, they're hurting early education, they're destroying K-12, they're ruining higher ed. It is really time for us to remind the legislature that even before the payment of debt, the priority in California should be the education of our children. When I graduated from high school in 1965, my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation went through a terrible war and a before that, a Great Depression. They had very little in life, but they created the finest system of public education in the nation at that time. The fact is that they went about it. They kept, we were one of the two states that kept child development after the end of the Second World War. New York and California didn't get rid of the program. They weren't able to build on it as much as they should have, but they kept it. In K-12, we were fifth of the 50 states. We were right up there with New York and per pupil spending. <coughs> Excuse me. When I left to go to UC Davis in 1965, nine of the 10 campuses of UC were built and open. All but three of the CSU campuses were built and open. All but two of the main campuses of the community college were built and open. The reality is these people coming out of depression and war figured out that the country would get rich if we educated our people. At that time, According to international studies, the Office of Economic Cooperation and Development said that America at that time was number one in moving people out of the working classes and lower classes into the middle class and upper middle class. Number one in the nation. Now we've dropped to something like 13 and we're headed downward steadily. Why? Because the rest of the world looked at America and said, yeah, they get so rich. Oh, they invested in educating their kids. Let's do that, shall we? Not just in K-12, but in higher ed, and oh yes, in preschool. In fact, the Europeans are way beyond us, and most of Asia is way beyond us in child development before the age of five. 
When I had my Universal Preschool Task Force, I went to uh, France as a guest of the French American Foundation. It was not your tax dollars at work. <clears throat> when I got to France, and some of you heard me talk about this because it was astounding, I went with Karen Hill Stott from Los Angeles, who co-chaired my task force, but the editor of the Miami Herald was with us. He went home and quit his job and went into trying to move uh, preschool into a priority in, in Florida, and the voters voted for it over the objections of Governor Bush at that time. The reality is there was a CEO from a corporation up in, from a bank up in uh, Colorado. He quit his job and started working on preschool. But the truth is we went into these French preschools, which opened at eight, and go from eight to four, but you can buy wraparound services either earlier or later. But everybody gets to go to preschool from eight to four. Lunch is served on tables that have tablecloths, real silverware, real napkins, real plates. The lunch was what the teachers ate, the same as the kids. One day it was roast lamb and radicchio salad. Another day it was a magnificent shepherd's pie with an arugula salad. Every preschool I went to, by the way, had a garden in it. It was truly a tribute to the people of France that this was going on. And I said to the woman who ran the program, and by the way, her, her son married a Californian and is a doctor living in Menlo Park. And so she was wanting to know why we were so backwards since we were America and why France was so far ahead in preschool. <clears throat> and I said, um, well, you know, we just have to, we have to build our case better. We just have to build our case. I mean, what does your research show since you've been doing this for over 50 years? What does your research show? And she says, <laughs> Well, we do not have so many of the great research with institutions as you have in America. We read your research, and it is very good. And, and it says this is a very important thing. The most important. There's a fellow sitting at lunch with us who's the mayor of the small town in France. The town provides the facility, and the national government pays to staff the facility. And so the mayor has a stake in this facility. He has a dog in this fight. He was there with us, supporting this. And I said to him, you know, you have, what, six or seven political parties in France. I mean, they have the Gaullists and the Conservatives and the Liberals and the Socialists and the Communists. And I, I knew that from my old days as teaching poli sci. And so I said, you know, you have, you have uh, six or seven political parties. Which one of them goes after education when times are tough? And he looks at me over his glasses and he says, <laughs> No one would dare, it would be the end of that party. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying to you all. It is, a, it is a shame and a disgrace that both political parties seem to be pointing fingers at each other and neither is really making the level of investment and commitment to the children of this state that we need, especially to the poorest children of this state. We are determining the future by what we do over the next few years in terms of kindergarten to <clears throat> in terms of before kindergarten. And we ought to be having a conversation about kindergarten being full day. If the French can have a full day preschool, we ought to be able to figure out how to full day kindergarten. We ought to make kindergarten mandatory. You know what the Department of Finance testified against the bill I was sponsoring to make kindergarten full day and mandatory, and we had some money at the state at that time? The Department of Finance said, well, they had two good reasons to be against it. First, it was an unnecessary bill because all kids were in kindergarten. And second, it would cost another 150 to 300 million a year for the 70,000 to 100,000 kids that would show up, which were who weren't registered in kindergarten. And I got up and said, you know, it's one or the other. Either they're there, in which case there's no cost, or they're not there, in which case there's this cost. You can't have it both ways. Department of Finance knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. And it is time that we say that out loud. Department of Finance should be having a conversation with the governor and with the legislature about how we promote better and more complete and more thorough child development before the age of five. You know very well that many of the children that we need to be thinking about child development at different hours, many of the children's parents do not work routine hours. We need to do much more about their health before they enter kindergarten, and we do need to do much more about nutrition both in preschool and in child development centers, but also once they get to school. 
And I've been in the schools of California where the teachers on Friday afternoon stuff kids' pockets full of fruits and nuts and even candy bars because they're afraid the kids won't eat again until Monday morning when they get to school. The reality is that this state is hiding its head in a, in a trough when it comes to thinking about the future, when it comes to thinking about how we are going to be successful as a state. The Silicon Valley is not here because of a juxtaposition of, of planets. It's here because we invested in education during a critical period in American history. And the governor's proposal, by the way, in addition to the 62,000 he's about to kick to the curb, he and his predecessor have already kicked out 100,000 kids out of child development in the state of California. We already have uh, <clears throat> so many cuts that have occurred. And when you think about these children, you have to remember that 38,000 of the 62,000 are Latino. More than 10,000 are African American. 32% of these children have single mothers. We are not, you are really going to cause some mothers to decide whether they're going to leave a latchkey child under the age of five at home, put them in an unsafe circumstance, or quit their jobs. And that is just boneheaded dumb. Uh, I will tell you that I believe that in addition to the de devastating cuts themselves, that pushing this in to the counties and, and taking it out of the Department of Education is wrong-headed. And it really is <laughs> So the research is clear. The, let me just give you one other statistic, which I think is so stunning. The number of poor children in this state has increased by 1.6 million in the last 20 years. American, the California share of children in poverty used to be one in 10, it's now one in six. We have one in eight kids, but we have one in six of the poorest kids in America. And that is why this is especially devastating for the kids that are left. It's sad though that, that one poll that Jumpstart did found that 73% of Americans wrongly believe that if children enter kindergarten unprepared, they will catch up in elementary school. Quite frankly, we know that is not true. Children that enter Kindergarten, thousands of vocabulary words behind, with, with many, many, many def deficits in their development, will never catch up in most cases. That's a sad but accurate description. And if anything, <clears throat> The Economist magazine noted, there is evidence that America and Britain, the countries that combine high female employment with reluctance to involve the state in childcare, serve their children especially poorly. A report by UNICEF in 2007 on children in rich countries found that America and Britain had some of the lowest scores for well-being. And we have, things have gotten worse since 2007 when that was done. The percentage of women with preschoolers are working today than were working during World War II. We know that. And we know that we are one of the few industrialized countries in the world without a high-quality, comprehensive system of child care and child development something we knew about in World War II, but somehow don't know about today. And what, what's really important to understand is that the brain really is a network. <laughs> There's a bunch of little connections that are being made in our lives, but most of them are made before the age of five. And many of them you cannot go back later and make those connections. It's just too late. A researcher at UC Berkeley hypothesized that if a child was born with cataracts and the cataracts were not removed by the time the child was 18 months old, the child would never learn to see. Why? Because those synapses, those connections that are made in the brain about sight were not made in time. And even if you corrected with cataract surgery after 18 months, the child would never, would be blind for life. She tested that by sewing the eyes of primates shut. Some of you won't like this. But she found that all of the primates whose eyes were sewn shut at birth, when their eyes were opened, were blind for life. When we think about this, remember that when you are born, you have the full complement of brain cells. The question is, what are we going to do to develop those cells? For some, these, <clears throat> by age of three, there are a thousand trillion of these synapses, these connections, that are made. Others are, happen at three or four or five,
But if they don't happen then, they can never happen. We missed the boat. And so, in fact, every dollar that Jerry is saving, we know is going to cost us between $7 and $14 later on. It's going to cost us with special education increases. It's going to cost us with kids being held back. It's going to cost us with kids in summer school. It's going to cost us with kids in other safety net programs. And then it's going to cost us when they drop out. It's going to drop. It's going to cost us when they are unemployed for long periods of time. It is going to cost us when they wind up on welfare. It is going to cost them when they wind up in the prison system. In fact, I am ashamed to tell you that this morning in California, where we've dropped to 47th in per pupil spending, we are number one in per prisoner expenditure. And I have not found a single person in the state that thinks that's a good plan. Let me see the hands of all of you who think that's what we ought to be doing. Come on now. Oh, nobody here either. I've said this to rotaries. I've said it in, in university meetings. I've said it in all manner of meetings. One woman came up to me after I said it, and she said, my husband's a correctional peace officer, and I don't think it's a good idea. The fact is that we our values are screwed up. And here's the big point I want to make to all of you. Don't let legislators look you in the eye and say they haven't got the money to do this. Amen. Budgets are statements of values. Think about how you budget in your house. You don't look at your kids and say, well, you're spending, I spend more money on you than I do on anything else, so you're going to have to suffer the deepest cuts. I just think my parents can When I was a kid, going, I got accepted at UC Davis and I really wanted to go, but my dad, the machinist, had been on strike the year before. They'd gone through all their savings. My mother was a dress clerk. My dad, incidentally, thought they needed to buy a new car and we had a Studebaker, it was 10 years old and it was, well, Stop making them in 1960, so they, they was afraid they couldn't get parts for it. My mother wanted a new couch. My brother and I had practiced our trampoline skills to a fairly well on the old couch. And it was really actually had actual springs coming up out of the bottom. My dad had lost his mother a couple of years earlier, and he wanted to go to the family reunion in Kentucky. So what did they do? They said, we won't we'll buy a used car, and we'll buy a small, worse couch, and we'll buy a, go on a shorter trip. And no, no car. No couch, no Kentucky, they sent their daughter to college. That's values. And what's wrong in California is we are not budgeting with the values of the people of the state. And so for me, I'm wondering why we're not having a conversation about universal preschool, why we're not having a conversation about fully funding child development, why we're not having a conversation about what we can do to make sure there are gardens and opportunities for better lunches in every preschool and school in the state of California. I want to know why we're not having a conversation about how we help our kids to go to college. Why is it that we are spending so much? The college student loan debt is greater than the credit card debt of the people of the United States right now, and that's crushing, and it's wrong. So I'll just tell you, I love, as I said, the scientist in the crib says this. The human baby's computational system is really a network held together by language and love instead of by optic fiber. I want to talk to you and I want you to help me advocate for how we build that network of children's brains and children's hearts. And how do we go back to an America that had the vision and the courage and the heart to look at the future? What we know and our research tells us very clearly is that Kids that go that have an opportunity to have child development before kindergarten do better academically and socially. We know that kids are have a reduced likelihood of being retained or dropping out or becoming juvenile delinquents. We know they have a greater likelihood of attending college, and we know they are more likely to avoid long periods of unemployment. One study out of the University of North Carolina looked at the average IQ of kids who went to preschools and child development and found that the average IQ increase was 13 points. But it was nearly nothing for a child whose mother was a college graduate. It was 33 points for a child whose mother had an IQ of 70 or less. When you look at a 13 or 14 year old girl who's pregnant, you see a child that probably isn't going to finish high school, that is going to have truncated life opportunities, that will not develop fully mentally herself. And the to condemn her baby here in a country where we've got so many people thumping their chest about being pro-life. They're not pro-life, they're pro-conception. It's downhill after that. This state ought to be paying for prenatal care. 
This state ought to be paying for comprehensive care for babies from the time the mother is forced to go back to work. And under the Welfare Reform Act, we said mothers who had to go back to work is when their kids were as young as four months old. California, we let them stay home until they're nine months old. Whoopee. But the truth is, I, I look at these kids, and I know that in there, there's, there's Einstein and Edison. There's Whoopi Goldberg, and, and there, there are genius children that are going to be left in the cul-de-sac of life if we don't do something about this. At the end of the day, I'll just tell you that, that Einstein really was probably a special ed child in today's world. Edison's mother was told, it's a good thing your boy's good with his hands. He'll never be much in school. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg is dyslexic, so is Tom Cruise. The world's history has been written by people with developmental disabilities and difficulties, but somebody believed in them and loved them and realized that if we helped them with development, they would perform better in every aspect of life, including in their human style. At the end of the day, then, I'll just tell you a wonderful analysis that was done by Cohen and Vicaro and Jennings talked about the pay you later price tag. They estimate the social cost of not providing quality care and developmental opportunities to young children, quote, create a, an array of bad outcomes, including child abuse and neglect, high school dropouts, criminal activity, teen pregnancy, drug and alcohol abuse, and other health problems. All of these expensive social ills could be significantly diminished through investments in evidence-based early childhood programs, end quote. Now I have to say the public is with us, but we're gonna to have to really beat the bushes to get them excited about Molly Munger's initiative. But the truth be known, the public supported Proposition 10, even though the tobacco industry that time put $42 million in to defeat that. And Rob Reiner, who is one of my heroes, Rob Reiner, you know, went to his dad and said, I'm dad, Carl Reiner, I need a couple million more dollars. And went to some other big people in, in Hollywood. He was still outspent seven to one. But we won Prop 10. But the tobacco industry made it close, just as they defeated 29 this week. So they went and put it back on the ballot. We won by a much bigger margin the second time. So then the legislature went to steal the money, and this time they had to ask the public. The judge had said they had to ask the public. And the public, by a two to one vote, said, keep your mitts off the first five. We need to an effort. And when somebody says, well, if you want to do it, you're going to have to pay for it. Why do we have to pay when high-speed rail and water and all the rest of it don't have to pay? The children should come first, and they ought to figure out later how they're going to pay for it if they have to. But I'm for it, and I'm for Molly's initiative. At the end of the day, I will just say to all of you that I think the, the research shows that we might save somewhere between two hundred and fifty and five hundred thousand dollars on these other costs that we're going to have for these kids if we spent a little bit of money to give them preschool. I think we have to be absolutely certain about that. And I, I say to you, why don't we go to the legislature and say, you know, you've been asked over twenty times to raise tobacco taxes, and twenty times you failed. Why not get a little bit of spine and stand up and raise tobacco taxes and put it into more preschool, put it into more child development. Use it to fund it if that's what you have to do. But by God, the public voted against 29, not because they didn't want to tax tobacco, but because of that terrible set of ads that the tobacco industry put out saying the money was going out of state. The truth is, we can, in fact, find ways to pay for things if we really put our minds to it, just as our just as my parents have figured out how to send their daughter to Davis. I also, we have to stay together, though. We've got to link arms with everybody in education. Don't let us be played off against K-12. Don't let K-12 be played off against higher education. We need to be together. If I gave you 58 pencils, one at a time, you could break all 58. If I gave you 58 pencils together, as the 58 counties in California, you can't break them. The strongest person you know can't break them if they're together. So however many we need to put together, let's put them together and let's vow that we're going to fight for education because they, they're going to come for preschool and child development this time, but next time it'll, it'll be K-12 and higher ed. And in fact, they've already done that some. I will also say that um, according to this study, there are a whole bunch of countries doing better than, than we are. The fact is that 
We, the other thing we need to start fighting for in this state is paid maternity leave for women. Do you know how many countries don't have paid maternity leave? Remember, we're pro life, right? Four countries. The United States of America, Swaziland, Papua New Guinea, and Liberia. How do you like traveling in that crowd? It's time to say that we believe that parenting is important. We need the time to make sure that babies and parents bond, and then we need an opportunity to make sure those children have developmental opportunities when their mothers go back into the workforce when they're nine months old. The fact is that the CDE, CCDAA needs to go to the ramparts after this meeting. You need to communicate with your local legislators. You need to ask your parents, are you registered to vote? Have you thought about registering to vote? If they're not citizens, do you know how you can become a citizen and then register to vote? A citizen in the last election. She had lived here in this country for over 20 years. She wanted to vote for Hillary, I'll tell you. <laughs> but the truth is that she fights for her grandkids who are going to UC Davis and are going to Sonoma State and are gonna have better lives than their grandmother had because she's got a dream for them and her kids have a dream for them. And we have to have dreams for these children. Neil Postman said, children are a message we send to a time we will never see. At least some of us in this room are living in a time our parents did not live to see. We were sent here prepared and we must do that for the next generation of children. That is our solemn duty. And if it means we have to become political, then let's get on it because we time is a wasting and lives are being lost literally and figuratively every day. <laughs> I've lived long enough to conclude with this observation. There's nothing wrong with our children. I am, however, worried about some of the grown-ups. We have to help them to find their way. We have to help them treat education as if it is the most important thing. Child development it is the, as it is the most important thing. Not only because the Constitution says it, because we know it's true. Thank you all and God bless you.